finding very important because these are quite uh, quite the basic things uh, I talked in the beginning. But uh, the topic is that uh, revisiting paleology. Paleology is a time. Uh, what I will explain and through the migration pattern of bivalvia. So let's be just uh, for the beginning. If we just uh, tell you now that uh, there was a time when the ocean organisms of the western part of China was very much similar to the organisms of Belgium and Germany and some parts of France. How would that sound? And if I tell you like the Western Indian subcontinent, uh, some organisms, marine organisms were very much similar to Spain and France and Eastern American regions. So this sounds quite um, uh, vague and not uh, very much, uh, very much with uh, correct explanation. But with time, we can uh, going to learn how this thing happened and when this thing actually happened. So talking about when, we should uh, first define the time. So the time, as I mentioned in my first slide, that is paleogene. Paleogene is a time defining unit. It is a period. Now this whole geological time, just after the art got formed around 4.3 billion years ago, after that, the Earth's time, the geological time frame has been divided into two eons. And within this eon, there are subdivisions of eras. So there are three very pronou pronounced and prominent eras from when the organisms started to live and were very diversified. <laughs> These eras are called as the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Now, Mesozoic is very much uh, popular because of the popular culture of these uh, dinosaur movies, Jurassic World and Jurassic Park 1, 2, 3, and all those things. But rest of the time is less talked about. So I will focus on all of this less talked about era, that is the Cenozoic era, which is the most recent one. And I will talk about the very past period of the Cenozoic era. So what we are talking about? We are talking about Cenozoic era. And the past period of Cenozoic era that is known as Paleogene. Now, if we dip, uh, go a bit closer to this Paleogene, we will see that just after the ages of dinosaurs, when the dinosaurs roaming around all in this globe, a very big meteorite struck this earth. And at the end of Cretaceous, the meteorite struck happened, and a very big impact happened, and all the dinosaurs from the land, from oceans. And ammonoid, another very important organisms of the time Mesozoic era, got vanished. And that is known as the mass extinction event. Now, this mass extinction event is not the only one mass extinction that is that happened during end Cretaceous. Mass extinction event till date has happened five times, including the end Cretaceous. And right now, presently, we are going through the sixth mass extinction event. So just after the very big mass extinction event, how the earth responded, how the organisms of the time responded, that can be seen through the Paleogene time organisms. That's why Paleogene is one of the most key important factors for choosing uh, for my research. Not only that, if we see this is the end of Cretaceous, the dinosaur got extinct, and from the end Cretaceous onwards, there was a global warming or from the scientific perspective, it is called hot house or warm house. So it was going for around 10 million annums and much more than that, around 17 million annums. So for the past 10 million annums, it was a called small, another time defining unit called Paleocene. And after that Paleocene epoch, there was a very big and pronounced, uh, pronounced global warming. You can see by this sharp peak, which is called at the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. So during this Thermal Maximum, the global warming happened like, uh, like 5 to 6 degrees higher temperature than the usual temperature present during that time. So temperature rose and the temperature was quite high for the next 10 million annums. After that, temperature started to decline and slowly during this Eocene epoch, <coughs> the temperature went so down that it went into a cool house. And during this cool house, it is a very important phenomena. Like during this cool house, in Cenozoic uh, era, for the first time ever, the cryosphere formed. 
Now, what is this stress shift? Stress shift is nothing but the polar ice caps. So, the first polar ice cap formed in the southern hemisphere, Antarctic regions. So, it started to form from the middle Eocene onwards. And the art was going slowly into the cool house phenomena. But that's not all the scenery of this time. During that cool house phenomena, when it was starting, there was very pronounced global warming as well. You can see through this uh, very, uh, very pronounced peaks. These are the time uh, temperature defining peaks. So the temperature rose again for quite a few times. And as the temperature rose, so during that cool house, there was global warming happening. Now, if we compare that time with the present scenario, this is the present time and in the, into the future. So the present time is defined as Anthropocene epoch. Because of this global warming that is happening just after the industrial revolution for the last 200 and 250 years till now, and it will be going beyond our time. Because of this uncontrolled emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the temperature is rising, and it is quite similar to the past environment when the temperature was quite high. You can see from these curves. If we can control this environmental uh, scenario and uh, control our carbon dioxide emissions, then we can make control and it will remain in the ice house phenomena and it was continuing before this industrial revolution. But that all depends upon us, how we control this thing. So that's how, how the organism responded to the global warming that is happening within the schoolhouse period that can be seen through this study of this paleogene uh, bivalve or the organisms and that can be extrapolated into the present, present situation of this global warming and thus uh, climatic problems. During the paleogene also, uh, there was happening uh, pronounced transgressions that the coastal regions were getting flooded due to this uh, warm temperature, temperature rise. So here again, you can see that uh, the coastal regions of Europe and a very vast region of uh, Northern America, Southern America were getting flooded. That south shallow shelf regions of oceanic part was getting generated during that time. And very pronounced tectonic events was also happening. Now, what is the tectonic events? You can see just before the Paleogene, India subcontinent was residing in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was already moving from the southern hemisphere towards the northern hemisphere. And there was uh, not very much pronounced oceanic gap between the southern uh, America uh, and Antarctica and here in Australia and Antarctica. But just see this animation. You can see that Australia is moving north, the southern America is moving north, and India already collided with the Eurasian plate. That's how the Himalayan mountain region was formed. Africa also collided with the Eurasian plate and here the Alps, Balkans, Pyrenees mountain chains were formed during that time. And due to the opening of this great passage between the Southern America and Antarctica and opening of Tasman Gateway between the Australia and Antarctica, here the Antarctic circumference current started to flow that actually disconnected Antarctica from the rest of the world. That's how the warm current from this equatorial region could not reach the Antarctic region from that time onwards. That's how the Antarctica became so much cold that all this green vegetation got vandalized and it entered into a cool house and the cryosphere had been formed in Antarctica. So now all of these things were happening during that time, but why Bivalvia to study that time? Very basic thing, uh, Bivalvia belongs to the phyla mollusca here. Uh, and within this phyla mollusca, there are uh, quite a few classes. Among those classes, one is the bivalvia. Bivalvia are the organisms uh, which we always see, like having uh, in the in the uh, maybe if we visit in beaches or any uh, shallow shelf oceanic parts, we can see there's uh, small organisms having uh, external exos exoskeleton, uh, having two valves. They open their valves like this, and then they close this and they sometimes they move over the sand and uh, like that. So those are those bivalvia. Bivalvia come from the word bivalve, that is two valves. So it is the exoskeleton mollusca. 
a class of mollusca. For choosing bivalve, the main reason is that during the Cenozoic time, among the oceanic organisms, mollusks were one of the most predominant and abundant forms. Now, if we want to know about a time, we should focus on an animal which was abundant during that time because the bivalve was abundant during that time. Not only that, it actually occupies like all type of habitats in the salocell regions, in the estuarine environment, where the freshwater and the marine water mixes, in the somewhat sometimes in the freshwater dominated zone as well, and as well as in the deep marine. And they can adapt to the situation depending upon their mode of living. Some of them burrow, some of them uh, cement to a substratum, some of them swim, some of them crawl, some of them just lie freely. So everywhere you'll see bivalvia, bivalvia, bivalvia. That's how the bivalvia became the, so much abundant that if we want to know about the time, bivalvia is one of the reasons. The second reason behind choosing bivalvia is that their cycle of life. After the larva of bivalvia is born, uh, they go through, after the, just the larva, they go through a stage of either of these two stages either lecidotrophic or plantostrophic stage. So lecidotrophic is the stage when the larva feeds upon the egg yolk. The egg yolk associated with the larva. So they feed on the egg yolk. And another one is the plantotrophic larva, which depends upon the planktons. So when they are feeding on the planktons, the specific bivalve, they are most of them feeding on the planktons, they get suspended in the water column. So they are suspended freely on the, in the water column. That's how they are very much susceptible to move or disperse from one place to another just by the ocean current. Wherever the ocean current will take them, they will move around the ocean current. But that's only during the larval time. When they get uh, metamorphosed and get adults, their shell being formed, the exoskeleton that we see on the shore and in the other places. <coughs> Then they are just uh, either they are boarding, they are burrowing, they are uh, uh, captured some kind of uh, hard substrate for cementing, then they are not moving. But when they are in the alpha stage, they are moving along with the ocean current freely. So wherever the ocean current is taking them, they are going. That's how if we can trace the dispersion pattern or migration pattern of the bivalvia, we can trace that the ocean current as well. Here is you can see if we compare those moving my bivalvia larva with some kind of a pirate ship. Now the pirate ship can go its its ultimate destination is this island, small island where there is a treasure trove hidden. But they can end up anywhere in the booms or maybe in the shops anywhere. So what will they do? They will try to reach here, but they are just dependent upon the ocean current. So, either if they end up being somewhere in these regions where the boom or the octopus is there, they will try to adapt, to fight the environment, to adapt their body, and that is called mutation. And if from the primary origin, from here to here, there is a geographic barrier is being formed, then the mutation will happen, and due to the barrier, there will be speciation. Because from the primary uh, assemblage of them, and the secondary assemblage of them, there is a specific difference between their uh, common traits. The common morphological character has not been retained because they had to adapt to the specific temperature, specific salinity, specific um, uh, pH level, everything. So their morphology has been adjusted to some level. So there is happening some speciation. So the species will be different from the primary place to the secondary place, but the genus will remain same. So there will be allopatric speciation. So we have to trace the genera only. If we concentrate only on the species, then our uh, focus will be much more restricted. When if the speciation happens, we cannot trace them back. So we focused on the genera and now just by looking at another uh, uh, animated picture, the ship uh, 
the ship that started uh, quite a few years ago has been located in four places. Say, for example, in the western coast of USA, uh, in the Florida, in uh, maybe France, uh, Normandy region, and in the uh, Russian region of Kamchatka. Can anybody say that uh, what is the shelling path of this sea? From where to where this uh, ship has uh, uh, ship has sailed? What is its starting point? What is the path they have taken? It's difficult because no time has been mentioned that like where the ship was first noticed. Now just look at this picture. Well, the ship was uh, first noticed uh, uh, maybe uh, in the first of October 2023 at the coast of Russia. And after that, in the month of December, it has been noticed in California region. Then, then what is the sharing path of the ship? The ship uh, shared from uh, Kamchatka region uh, through the North Pacific uh, current towards California. So it took the ocean current, North Pacific current. Am I right? Say so for another example, then the ship has been located uh, in the month of uh, March at uh, Eastern coast of America. And after that, uh, sometime, uh, oh no, before that time in Europe. So what is its sailing path? It sailed through the northern equatorial current, through the southern margin of uh, Antarctic uh, Atlantic uh, circumference current, uh, North Equatorial Canary uh, Stream and North Equatorial current. It sailed from uh, western part of Europe toward America. That's how, just by looking at the stratigraphic position of the Bible genera where we have located, either it's older to a certain region or younger to a certain region. Where it was first been located? Is it older or younger in the time scale? And what is the second time it has been located? That's how we have traced back the migration pathways. And that's how we have rebuilt the ocean paleo currents that were present during that time. So this is the rule of the game. And if we look into the past right now, we can see this, this was kind of a uh, paleo coastline map developed by Scottish. And when we uh, did this uh, statistical analysis, uh, this is a network diagram uh, having all the six small edges of that time uh, from Paleocene uh, to Oligocene. Within this Paleogene period, we have seen uh, some very prominent traits where you can see that the older occurrence of Bibles have been found in Western Indian province that is here and relatively younger occurrence of the same Bibles have been found in European province. So what is the migration pathway that they have they must have migrated from the Western India towards Europe. The next trait we have seen that the between the European regions and the Eastern American regions there is no time gap. So, the either way the migration is possible from Europe to America or from America to Europe. Another thing that from Western America to Japan and Eastern Russian regions, Western America is much more older, that is from Lutetian, that is older, to Japan, that is Priabonian, much more younger. So, from Western America to Japan, the migration was happening. So, in the Pacific Ocean here, the migration was happening west in westward direction. In the Atlantic Ocean, the migration was happening in both ways. In the Paleo Tethys, this was the Tethys Ocean. In the Paleo Tethys, the migration was happening again from east to west. Now we have drawn the Paleo coastline map along with the oceanic currents, and we are focusing on the Thanesian Age, that is the uppermost age of the Paleocene epoch within the Paleogene period. What we can see? 
this is again a network diagram of that time where these are the provinces. Provinces is nothing but uh, a accumulation of bivalvia or any kind of organisms which have a very good amount of similarity among themselves from one location to another. And they have endemic genera or species up to at least 10% and more than 10%. So these are two provinces of the Eastern American coast and one in the Western American coast. And this with India, the Eastern American coast bivalves share a very weak feeble relation, but there was a relation. So the, as the migration pathway was from east to west, so some bivalves from the western coast of India migrated to the eastern coast of America and through the open Panama Gateway, it reached the western coast. That's how the relation was established. And another very important thing to notice that during that time, between the Eurasian region, this region was called the Paratethys. Paratethys is a shallow subcontinental sea and that was present during that time that facilitated a oceanic current within this region and connected Belgium and China. This is Xinjiang province of China. We have seen very prominent uh, genetic similarity with these uh, bivalves of China and Belgium. So this presence of this shallow oceanic current has been hence proven by this uh, very prominent relation with China and Belgium. Moving forward, during Eprisian, younger age to the Thanesian age, then uh, as I was already told about, that was there very pronounced global warming happening in the Paleocene, Eocene boundary and along with that the global transgression, a very vast region of the coastal regions got submerged on all these regions. So the diversification of bivalves very much uh, increased and that's how more regions started to host in the shallow shelf regions the bivalvia genera. That's how a much more uh, deeper part of European region started to host bivalvia and it, were, it, it, it established a very pronounced and prominent relation with the Middle Eastern regions because with the relict Tethys part, there was a gap in this European part and the shallow shelf oceanic current entered into this zone and connected all these regions to one another. And India, as the ocean current was from east to west, the Indian region also was getting connected to all these regions. And in the Atlantic Ocean, as the migration path, path was from east to west and west to east, so from eastern part of American coastline, some bivalvia migrated towards the western part of Europe and from some part of western Europe, the bivalve again migrated towards the coast of America and again the bivalves from um, uh, India and this Middle Eastern regions also took this pathway and again they uh, went past the uh, Panama Gateway and reached some parts of this western America. But there is another story. Uh, just before this uh, Paleocene and uh, Thanesian and Eprisian, there was uh, a shallow shelf region that was present in this uh, American region that actually connected the eastern coast of America and the western coast of America that got vanished from the Eprisian onwards due to plate tectonic reasons. That's why the older Bible bear that were present during that time, that actually was very much prominent to uh, establish a close relation with the east coast of, of America and the west coast of America. During the Middle Eocene, uh, there was uh, actually the eastern coast of America were much more closer to one another uh, in terms of Bible similarity. The relation with the eastern coast of America and western coast of America was much more feeble than the earlier time but all the other relations were as similar as it was during the early years. In much younger times, uh, the, due to the transition, the shallow silt regions that were, got flooded in the early years in time were uh, much more disconnected during this time because the regression already started to happen and the global cooling from middle nutrition onward started to happen in all of these arts. So due to this global cooling and those regression, the basins of Europe 
were getting disconnected from one another. So most of the basins were already hosting the bivalvia and there was large diversity, but they are not very much prominently connected to one another to form a single province. That's how we can see here by three color coded regions, three different provinces, but there were quite a few uh, bivalvia that maintained their connection with one another because of the presence from earlier times. And the rest of the regions were getting were connected to one another as similar to the Lutetian time that was the past to Bartonian. And the last of this Eocene epoch, uh, we can see that uh, again a translation happened and all of the Europe was getting flooded and the they are forming a single province. And here is one prominent thing you can, you can see by this network diagram. The Indian subcontinent continent lost, lost its connection or most of its connection with the European and the Middle Eastern regions. There is no very prominent Bible diversity in the Middle Eastern region because of this shallowing of the Tethys Gateway. The Indian plate already collided with the Eurasian plate. That's how the Tethys Shiway in this north of India got closed. And here it is much more shallow than the older times. That's how the connection is much more feeble than the earlier times. But here, the Northern Pacific current and Alaskan current was uh, establishing a very close relation with the west, western coast of America and the Russia and Japan. Here, the Japan and Russia is forming a big province during this time for the first time ever. Moving forward, uh, the Indian subcontinent lost all, its, all, all of its survival diversity because uh, there is uh, no more space. The shallow shelf region is almost got lost from the western part of India because of the collision and the regression that was happening during that time. It had no more connection with the European regions and the American regions as well. The Most of the Europe is land again. There is no more shallow shelf. But the rest of the connection in the Atlantic Ocean, two coasts of the Atlantic Ocean, and some parts of the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean part, mm -hmm. also getting connected to one another. And the relation between the western coast of America and the eastern coast of uh, Russia and Japan is much more stronger. And that was being facilitated by the Alaska current and northern Pacific current. So, how did this global warming and the global cooling actually affected the bivalvia? Here, these bars are the number of genera that were present during the time of each time slice. These are the ages, and here we can see the correlative time when the warm house was there and the cool house was there. So, during the warm house, when the global warming was happening, the number of genera was got very high from Thanesian to Eurasian, And the appearance of new genera was much more higher than the extinction. Mm -hmm. But with time, when the cooling started to happen, the appearance slowly declined, but the extinction got higher. And in fact, in the Priagomian rebellion boundary, when the cooling was there, the cooling struck the genera so much, the extinction is much more higher than the appearance. Why did that happen? Because here you can see that uh, it's not very prominent in this uh, in this in this in this uh, diagram, but uh, these are the uh, latitudinal distribution. And here, this is from this range to this range. It is the 30 degree north latitude to 60 degree north latitude. Same for all these three pictures. This is a part diagram of Paleocene time. This is from Eocene, and this is from Oligocene time. And all on these three times, the Bible, we are mostly concentrated in the uh, temperate climatic regions of 30 degree to 60 degree. So, when the global warming is happening, as the regions were getting flooded due to the transition that hosted most of the Bible genera and the diversity increased. But when the extinction happened, that actually struck more severely in the 30 to 60 degree range, while I will explain in the later slide and the extinction happened from these regions where the diversity was much more concentrated. That's how the extinction is much more fatal for the shallow shelf marine organisms of bivalvia in cooling period than the warming. 
during the warming period that is in the paleocene eocene boundary we can see here the appearance rate is much more higher in the lower latitudinal regions and in the temperate climatic zones but the higher latitude the polar polar uh, regions is not uh, experienced experiencing much more of appearance but look at the extinction rate the extinction rate is much more higher <laughs> in the higher latitudes in the polar regions because when the global warming is happening what will be the main objective of those any organism they will try to find their equitable climate and uh, temperature where they can decide now think about those organisms already residing in the equatorial and the temperate climatic regions they will start to migrate towards more higher latitude regions where they can find relatively cooler temperature because the temperature they are uh, residing already maybe 15 degree now the temperature of this region is 20 degree they can decide there anyway so they have to find this 15 degree temperature so what will they do they will try to find 15 degree temperature in my, much higher latitudes where their temperature is might be 15 degree which previously was maybe 10 degree that's how they started to migrate towards higher latitudes that's how the migration happened towards higher latitudes but think about those bivalves already residing in these polar regions they are accustomed to uh, reside in maybe uh, 5 to 0 degree of temperature now the temperature has been risen to almost 10 degree so what will they do they have no place to migrate they cannot go downwards to lower latitudes because the temperature is much more higher there so the extinction will be higher in the higher latitudes in contrary to which in the uh, cool house period in the eocene oligocene boundary uh, the extinction is much more higher from the equatorial and the temperate climatic regions and the appearance is uh, much more uh, is almost zero in the in the, in the equatorial regions but much more higher in the temperate climatic regions and higher latitudes as well 60 to 70 degree range already in the polar circle so the bivalves will automatically try to migrate towards lower latitudes to adapt to the environment the situation but the bivalves already residing in the temperate climatic and the equatorial regions they have no place to migrate similarly as in the uh, warm house period they started to migrate towards high latitude in this case they will try, try to migrate towards lower latitude but the lower latitude bivalves will try to find much more cooler temperature they will not fry so what will happen they will got extinct So what we can we can we can we can recollect from this whole presentation uh, that is the migration pathway uh, was mainly westward in the northern northern hemisphere regions in the temperate climatic regions towards the equatorial regions and the tectonic and the climatic changes actually has very uh, crucial roles on the diversification pattern. And, uh, and, uh, and the fatality or the mortality of the bivalves and cooling is actually much more fatal for the shallow shelf organisms like bivalves than warming. But who survived? Only those juveniles who were who did not have much more energy stored with themselves, like the adults, having you know, only depended upon the planters, they migrated. They were easy to migrate, it, migrate, and they actually migrate from one place to another and they survived before they were getting settled. So the juveniles can migrate and get survived, but not the grown ones who already got settled and borrowed deep inside their head in the sand. Uh, thank you all. And this is the reference that I have used, and this is the research work I have done with collaboration with Professor uh, Kalyan Haldar from Kolkata. And this presentation is already uh, been published in the conference abstract of this uh, conference, Bibles Where I'm Going in September, and this article is under review right now. Thank you all.